Hello everyone and welcome to your second core animation tutorial. In this tutorial I'm going to be briefly covering how we can change the start and end frames as we resize the view in uh, our so if our window is resizing how we can change the start and end frames to reflect that change in the window or view size. So that's just kind of an extension of the last tutorial since people had a bunch of questions on that. Um, the main part of this tutorial though is to talk about what the animator proxy means and kind of how it works. So you might not you know, completely understand it by the end of this tutorial, but hopefully you'll have a much better idea than just saying, well, we called this magic method animator and then it animates it for us. So hopefully by the end of this tutorial, you have a much better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes for when we call this magic method. All right, let's talk about resizing. So in the last tutorial, we made this awesome application that, uh, why is that not right? Let's restart that. All right, so if we redraw this, we can see that there's a bike there, but the problem is if we resize it, our frames no longer you know, are resizing with the view. So we would much prefer if the bike went from this end to this end to a new frame size that we were kind of trying to get at when we made the first tutorial. So in the first tutorial, we were saying that uh, you know we wanted it to be like these specific dimensions of the window, but of course, as we change the window, those start and end frames don't change with it. So how can we change that? Well, quite simply, my friends, one way we can change it, and there are probably more than one ways you can approach this, but the way that I think works pretty well is implementing this in draw rect. So draw rect is called any time your view essentially needs to redraw itself, which is if you ever resize your view, it'll always call a draw rect. And also if you happen to be, you know, drawing stuff in your uh, rectangle, then it'll also call a draw rect if you, you know, set needs display or something like that. So if you happen to need to redraw your view in any case, this is where it'll happen. And this always happens when you're resizing your view. So it's a decent place to put it. Now you might be thinking, well, why would I want to always call this though? You know, if I'm just trying to redraw my rectangle, then uh, I might not be resizing my view and I might not want to, you know, do the extra setting of start and end frames if they're just going to be the same thing. Well, you're right. And so there's a way to get around this, which is by asking the view whether it is currently redrawing it or resizing itself. And this method is called in live resize. So we're asking the view, hey, are you in live resize right now? And it'll tell us, yeah, of course I am. So do this. And that's what we'll do. If it's not, basically if it's not resizing, then it returns no and our if statement is false. All right, so what we want to do, if this is the case, we would like to reget our width and height for the current frame. So you might be looking at this like you just copied code, bad, bad, bad. And you're probably right, you probably shouldn't copy code, but uh, you could fix this easily by putting you know, this chunk of four things into a method like reset frames or something, and then you know, call that method. So there's a way, there's a way around this copying code that I'm doing, but we're just trying to make this a quick example. So, you know, you're not, you're not launching this as a app in the app store anytime soon, I'm sure. All right. So here we go. You know, we got our new width and height. We call self.frame that will just get our current frame of the view we're in so that we'll get our width and height. Then we just reset up our start frames with the dimensions we registered there. And then we just have to test where we are. So if our view is at the start, then we would like our image view to set the frame to be where we're at the start. And of course we changed it up above, so it'll now reflect that change. And we don't have to use the animator proxy for this because we're at, as we're live resizing, it's gonna be calling this every time anyway. So, you know, as you're slowly resizing the window, you're resizing the frame as it goes along. So you're basically animating it anyway. All right, so this is all we have to do for this. We can run this, check it out. As you can see, we got this cool bike. And as we move our window around, the bike stretches and 
you know, all that cool stuff. And then if we move it, we can see that it also reflects the change on the other end as well. Cool. We got it to work as we expected. Now, let's do what I actually want to do in this tutorial, which is talk about the animator proxy. So in the previous tutorial, basically before we could set the frame, we would just say image view set frame to be end frame. And we would get this instantaneous change from the current position we're at to the end frame or the start frame, right? Whatever frame we're setting it to. So the image view would instantly be reset to this new position with a new size, right? That's the idea without calling the animator proxy or this animator method. Now, when we call this animator method, all of a sudden, boom, we got cool animation, right? Magic happens. And that's great, but we'd like to kind of understand a little bit behind the magic, what's kind of going on there. So let's talk about that. And to talk about that, we've got some few graphics, lots of text, and me talking. So here we've got two different things. We have an NS view on our left and an NS window on our right. So what do both of these guys have in common? It's probably a trick question, or you could probably come up with a bunch of things maybe that you think they have in common, and maybe they do. But the one I'm actually looking for is that they both conform to this NS animatable property container protocol. So the protocol is called that long name, but basically what it means is that you can animate stuff. Woohoo! So there's uh, only two objects though that do implement this currently, which are NSView and NSWindow. Those are the two objects that Apple has chosen to animate because they're the obvious choices because those are the only two things we ever really animate. And so yeah, they're the two that uh, conform to the NS animatable property container protocol. Now, if you're not sure what a protocol is, uh, make sure you check out my Objective-C tutorial on protocols so you can kind of better understand what's going on here. But a protocol, just as a recap, maybe if you have watched it, is that it defines a bunch of methods. In this case, there's five methods that this class has to implement in order for this protocol to be fully fulfilled or for it to work correctly. So there are five required methods in this protocol that will allow animation to occur if you can implement them properly. So, however, this is an extremely complicated protocol to implement, and I would not uh, suggest by any means that you try to put this on some object you plan on making. I don't even know how you would animate something that you would create. I mean, I don't know what else you would try to make if it's not a view or a window. So if you got, if you got a suggestion of something that you would try to animate that's not a view or a window, you know, let me know. But uh, I think you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about that part. Just, just know that it's called that and it's a protocol that Apple implements in both NS view and NS window. All right. So what does it mean? Well, it basically means that any values that we set that are floats double NS point, NS size, or NS rect can be animated using the animator proxy. And this is just according to Apple's documentation that it has. I have no real knowledge of why that is, but uh, I assume because they're simple values. Anyway, those are the values that uh, they can be animated by the animator proxy. And uh, this protocol defines a few required methods. Like I was saying earlier, these five required methods right here to make or for a lot to allow this protocol to actually uh, work or to conform to it. So with that being said, what do these methods do? Because that's the important part. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is the animator method. And this is one we're familiar with because we used it right here when we were doing that. I'm sure you remember that. I'm sure I'm not showing you anything new. So basically, what this uh, returns for us, this animator method, simply returns an object known as the animator proxy. And this proxy is basically just serves as an object that behaves exactly as the object it's trying to animate. So in our example, we're calling image view animator, and this will return an object known as an animator proxy that should behave the exact same way that the image view behaves itself. So this is kind of obvious that it does behave this way because then we call set frame on it, right? Set frame is an image view property or a method 
more specifically it's in his view but nonetheless the point being is that the animator proxy can handle these methods right it handles these methods that are normally sent to the image view itself so the animator proxy or the object that's returned from this has to be able to be the same essentially as the object it's trying to animate okay that's cool so with that being said let's uh what am i trying to swap to back here so like i was saying proxy serves to be identical to the object it's animating now the difference though is that it will obviously animate anything that it can so any of the changes that you make the animator will animate versus the normal object all right so the next important part is that every class that implements this protocol so nsview and nswindow or any subclasses thereof have a set of default animations which are set up using this method class method called default animation for key now default animation for key simply defines a set of animations given a certain key so what's a key well if you haven't watched my objective seed tutorials like obviously i'm you know pushing in this uh, series so you you got to keep up with the objective seed but you know it is the language that you use so learn it um with that being said the keys if you watch the key value coding tutorial you would probably know what a key is but uh at least in this reference but the key that we're looking for is uh basically the method that's called so in our example where we're calling set frame frame would be the key that's passed uh, for set alpha value alpha value is the key name that we're referencing the key just kind of represents the method name or the property name that we're trying to adjust so if we were trying to adjust the frame origin the frame origin is the property or well it's a property obviously but it's the key that we would be adjusting so if we were calling set frame origin then we would be adjusting the frame origin if we were saying set frame size frame size would be our key hopefully you get the idea at this point all right with that being said let's jump back and the idea for this method is that it's you define it in whatever class so if you were a subclass you could define new default animations for things but that's you know for another st you know time if you uh, want to look at that but uh the point being is that it will return some kind of an animation given the key that we're looking at like i was just saying the key could be frame or frame size frame origin alpha value etc all right so uh, what about all those other methods that we had you know we had a few other ones and we had animations set animations and animation for key with the others that i haven't talked about so basically those methods are designed so that you can customize your own animation using uh, core animation animation objects so ca animation that is stands for core animation that's what the ca stands for and then animation so core animation animation objects these objects basically define different types of animation that you can have obviously so uh, there are certain subclasses of ca animation such as ca basic animation or ca keyframe animation there's ca uh, animation group there's a there's a bunch of different uh, subclasses of CA animation that just define ways that you would animate things so in our example we just kind of do this you know linear interpretation or interpolation rather of these objects so what I mean by that is that our pretty little motorbike in our example just went from one location and then at at this very constant rate right at this constant rate from our start to end it just goes at a constant speed right and over whatever period of time it had to go so that's kind of a very basic that is a basic animation so if we wanted to make a more complex one we could make one that you know slow you know speeds up right in the beginning and then it goes really slow at the end so you can adjust the way these animations perform and you can do that by calling the set animations method which takes in a dictionary of animations for particular keys so let's say i wanted to adjust the uh, animation when i call set frame so instead of just doing uh, this animation that's very linear which means it just you know goes at a constant speed from one one place to the other over some amount of time then 
we could change this animation by calling by calling set animations, passing in a dictionary which contained our new animation object, so it would define a new way to animate it, and the key would be the, the particular key that we're trying to animate, so frame in the example of set frame. If we wanted to adjust the frame origin, when we call set frame origin, we would pass in the key frame origin. So maybe you're getting the idea. So if I wanted to adjust the frame or the animation type, I could use the set animations method myself and pass in all the animations that I want for these particular keys. But this is all for later tutorials. I don't expect you to you know, be able to go out and try this on your own right now, but this is just hopefully giving you a better understanding of what all this means. All right, so lastly, I've got this awesome, sick picture that took me hours to make, as you could tell. And I'm gonna just kind of run through the process that will occur when you call what we were calling in our example. So here's me on the left, obviously, or it's you. I did make it too detailed, I guess. And essentially we're calling this method or you know, a bunch of methods right here. So the first part, right, in these little set of square brackets here, we called view animator, or in our case, we called image view animator. And this gets us this beautiful animator proxy object. Then on that object, we are calling set frame with some new frame value, right? And like I was saying before, the key for this is frame. So if you take apart, if you take away the set part, you've got this key called frame, and that's that's what it is. And yes, it is the lowercase f that would be the key. Yeah, that's just how it works. The, the actual property that we're animating is the frame, and it's not you you know it wouldn't be lower. It's not uppercase. Again, just watch the the key value coding tutorial if you want to learn more about keys, but. Uh, you know, all you don't really have to worry about it too much. We'll we'll use stuff when it's appropriate. So as we go through these tutorials, you'll get a better idea of what the keys mean. Anyway, so like I was saying, we have our beautiful animator proxy object here. Then we call set frame on it with some new frame. So what happens? Well, basically, instead of just changing the values right away, the animator object is or the animator proxy. It's going to do two things. First, it's going to check if we have defined any new animations for this. So basically, if we call this set, an, set animations object, or sorry, set animations method, and we want to define some new animation, right? So if we wanted our set frame not to just do what it did in our example with the bike, but we wanted to, you know, go really fast, then slow, then go to the end, right? We could define some new animation that would do that. And then we could call set animations and pass that in. So then that's stored in what's known as the animations uh, dictionary, basically. So what happens is we call set frame on our animator. It says, okay, well, the key is frame, right? And so we're going to pass, or we're going to ask the uh, for that animation if we have any. So then we'll call animation for key, pass in the key that we're looking for, right? We're looking for an animation when we change the frame. All right, so the animation for key takes this key called frame, and then it looks in the dictionary that it owns, the animations dictionary, asks it, hey, animations dictionary, do you have any animation for me using this key called frame? If the dictionary has any animation, it gives it back, right? And if there's nothing, then this method should just return nil. It just won't give anything back. That's fine. If we didn't set any special values, then, um, that's fine. And if we don't change anything on our view, then there won't be any dictionary even in here. There won't even be any special animations, right? This only exists if we have said that this view has special animations uh, when it, you know, for certain keys. So uh, what we're really doing every other time is using this section, right? So this section is when we get, we want to customize animations we set up specific animations for specific keys and animation for key will ask the animations dictionary if it has an animation for us to give back given a specific key. All right, so it doesn't, fine. Returns nil, I think. And if uh, it does that, then the animator says, okay, I'll just figure out what my default animation is given the key frame. And so it returns 
you know, uh, see it. in our case it returns a, a basic animation with uh, the time of 0.25, and then that's the animation that it makes, right? So there's a def default animation for every key. And this is simply defined in the NSView class, right? NSView would implement this default animation for key method, and it would say, okay, you know, if I pass in the key frame, then what kind of animation do I want to do, right? And m for most of them, they're all the same, but, um, you know, there, there might be different ones for different things. I really don't know, but I think for the most part, they all pretty much have this very simple animation. Anyway, that's how it works. If we didn't set up anything, then we just go to the default animations and find the one for that key. And when it gets back that animation, the animator knows then what kind of animation to perform on uh, whatever it has. So if it has some new frame and it's trying to animate that, we, we're given back some kind of animation object, and then it does the work to actually figure out what those changes will be. And it does those for us. So that's essentially how the animator proxy works. Uh, hopefully that made enough sense. But if you had any questions on uh, kind of, you know, the gist of what I covered in this tutorial, feel free to leave your questions in the comment section below. And in the next tutorial, we'll be talking about how we can actually get to this section over here, not just by, you know, not just using the default animations that are given to us. So in the next tutorial, we'll be able to add our own animations for specific keys, and we'll be diving into understanding all that good stuff then. But like I said, if you have any questions on these, feel free to leave your questions in the comment section below. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. If uh, you have any other questions, you can also send my your qu quick questions uh, to me on Twitter as well. I'll try to respond there and, uh, you know, follow me there as well. Anyway, uh, I will see you in lesson three for the core animation series. See you then.